All right. Let's jump back in. We have been doing a series on understanding the kingdom. Uh, and recently, specifically, we've been talking about the foundation of kingdom relationships. Uh, and part of what we've been doing is using the Gospel of Matthew to help look at some of these kingdom principles to be able to apply to our lives. Uh, we know that the kingdom of God has to be a priority for our lives. But if we don't stop and study it and pursue it and be preoccupied with it, uh, then we won't garnish the wisdom of the kingdom of God as we should. So it's, a, it's been a passion for me for years uh, in studying the kingdom and sharing the kingdom with others. And I just want to make sure that as we go forward in our lives that we are fully prepared to serve God and his kingdom. So the question that we've been answering is, what is God's design for how we should properly relate to one another? And we've been looking at Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 1 through 14. And that's where we stopped that last time. We'd already done the first several verses of chapter 7, and now we're going to finish up the second half of chapter 7 because we didn't get to finish that up last time. All right, so let's just review this scripture real quick. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, it says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who seeks, or rather, everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks him for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And then he says this. He says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And that's going to be a highlight, so keep that in mind. Verse 13 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, that's a very qualifying verse as well. We don't spend as much time on it in this particular ses session, but it's, it's an important one because we have to recognize that living a kingdom lifestyle in the midst of a very ungodly world is not an easy thing to do. And some of the commandments that Jesus gave us are not easy commandments to follow. I mean, when he's telling you stuff like, love your enemies, that's not easy to do. It's easy to say, and it's easy to picture, it's easy to think about, but it's another thing when you have to actually do it. When you know somebody that gets on your last nerve, when you have that person that you can't even stand the very sight of them, you get mad just thinking about the person. And yet Jesus says that it is your responsibility as a kingdom citizen to love that person. That's not easy to do. It's easy to want to do it, but the Bible says that even though the spirit is willing, the flesh is very, 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 very weak. There's a part of you that just want to cuss that person out. There's a part of you that just want to make that person feel as bad as they make you feel. But Jesus said that's not how we operate in the kingdom of God. So this verse right here, verse 13, is very important because Jesus qualifies the fact that it's not easy to do what's right. And he said this is why a lot of people never make it into the kingdom because it's too hard for them. It's easy to do what's wrong. It's easy to live a life of destruction. It's easy to live a life of sin. It's easy to live a life apart from God. Now, we would think that the opposite would be true. We would think that just because I say, okay, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to give you my whole entire heart, my whole entire life of yours. I'm going to worship you for every single thing that I have. We would think that, oh, man, from that point on, life is going to be easy. But it's not, not all the time. Now, that doesn't mean that your life just fall off the edge either. But there's no expectation that life in the kingdom is supposed to be easy. There's no expectation. In fact, when you look at the scriptures, you see something completely different. When you look at the, the, the story of, of John the Baptist, for example, John the Baptist did exactly what God called him to do. John the Baptist, the Bible says, was the one who would pave the way for the Lord make his path straight, did everything that he was supposed to do, live the life that God had called him to live. But he was a man who didn't even have a home. The Bible says he lived out in the desert. He was a man that didn't have a full course meal every day. The Bible says that he ate locusts and wild honey. 
He was a man who didn't have nice clothes to put on. Bible says he was dressed up in, in animal fur. He looked a mess. He smelled a mess. His breath was a mess. He was a mess. But he was living for God. He was doing exactly what God had called him to do. Not only that, the way he died was also unjust. The Bible said that, that John the Baptist died when a young lady was dancing for some people at a party and a king offered to give her whatever he wanted and she went and asked her mama, what should I ask, for, ask the king for? And his mama, who did not like John the Baptist, says, ask for John the Baptist's head on the platter. And the king having to keep his word because every word that comes out of a king's mouth is law, he has to keep his word. He called for John the Baptist's head to be cut off and brought on a platter so everybody can see. And this was a man that lived right. So we honor God with our lives. We honor God with our hearts. We live for him. But there is no automatic expectation that everything is going to be easy. So get that out of your mind. And here's why that's important. That's important because I don't want you to get all pumped up and happy and emotional about a life with God, and then when the minute things get hard, you give up because it's got hard. No, you need to expect it to be hard. You need to be prepared for the hardships because it is not easy. Anybody ever seen a wimpy warrior? A wimpy warrior. He got on all this, this armor, he got on, he got this sword, he got all this stuff, but he's a big wimp. It doesn't matter how you look on the outside if you're a wimp on the inside, am I right? Anybody can talk a big game. Anybody can look like they got it all together. But if, if you're wimpy in your heart, the minute things get hard, you're going to quit. You're going to give up. You're going to split. There's no perseverance in you. And I'm tired, and I'm, I'm, I'm done with, with raising wimpy Christians. I'm done with that. I want to raise kingdom citizens who have understood that they are more than conquerors, that, that recognize that they know how to fall down but get back up again, that can take a beating and keep on going. I, I, I'm raising young men and women for God who are able to stand up against opposition, who are able to, to come against challenges and still come out glorifying God in every single thing that they're doing. I, we don't have time to get caught up in all this petty stuff. Somebody said something bad about me and hurt my feelings and all, my whole entire day just ruined. No, we, we don't have time. That's petty. A lion does not turn around for a barking dog. Do you hear me? A lion does not turn around for a barking dog. You are like lions in the kingdom of God. And when people come up to you with petty, insignificant stuff that has no meaning in your life, stop turning around for that stuff. Stop letting those little things like that, those, those petty little issues, get you all out of your relationship with God. Don't ever be ashamed to exhibit your faith. Don't ever uh, be, be wimpy when it comes to, to demonstrating how much you love God and how much you want to live for him just because somebody's watching you. Jesus said, you'd be ashamed before me before me, and I'd be ashamed of you before my father. You live for God at whatever the cost, whatever it takes, no matter who's around. We're not raising wimpy Christians. We're raising soldiers for the, for the kingdom of God. Amen? So the first six verses of Matthew chapter 7 focused on what you should not do in relationships. We said that last time. You should not judge, criticize, and look down on others because they do not measure up to your standards. You should not impose your knowledge on others. Those are some of the things that we picked up in that. See, that, that's one thing about a soldier, too, is he knows what to do with the weak. A soldier who is properly trained knows how to handle civilians. You don't treat civilians like you do other soldiers who are in, a, in an opposing army. You treat civilians with, with respect. You treat them much differently. So when you meet people in life that may not be as further along in their faith as you are, who may not be as, as spiritually strong as you are. You don't look down on that person because of how they are. The old people, when I was growing up, used to say, the only time you look down on a man is when you're reaching down to pick him up. So as kingdom citizens, we don't step on people. We don't walk over people. We don't make people feel bad because they don't live up to our standards. No, we strengthen them. We encourage them because one day that might be us down there. Good people fall, not bad ones. Bad people are already there. It's good people who fall. It's good people who make mistakes. The Bible says 
that a righteous man falls seven times. A righteous man falls seven times. It, it didn't say a wicked man falls seven times. It said a righteous man falls seven times. Righteous. But it also said this. It said a righteous man falls seven times, but he always gets back up. That's the difference between a righteous man and a wicked man. A wicked man going to lay there and waddle in his mess. As a righteous man, you get back up. No matter how many times you fail, no matter how many times you fall short, you keep getting back up. Do y'all hear me this afternoon? I know you're tired. I know you, you, you're ready to go home, but stay with me. So that's what the first six chapters focus on. But Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 14, focuses on what we should do in relationships. So the first part focuses on what we should not do. The second part focuses on what we should do in relationships. And then it said this in verse 12, to be specific. It said, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. See, we have this tendency in relationships to focus on what we get out instead of what we put in. We have this natural tendency to figure out what can I get out of this relationship. Now, as, when we talk about relationships in, in this session, we, we're not talking about relationships in specific. We're talking about relationships in general. So th this isn't just referring to a relationship b between you and your family members or you and somebody you like or you got a crush on. It's not just that kind of relationship. The stuff that we talk about replies to any and every relationship. Whether it's a romantic relationship, a business relationship, a family relationship, a casual relationship, whatever the relationship is, these same principles apply. But we have this tendency to try to figure out what can I get out of this instead of what we put into it. Kingdom people are always trying to find ways to put life into people, not take it out or get things from them. They're always trying to find a way to encourage. They're always trying to find a way to give. They're always trying to find a way to lift somebody up. They're always looking for opportunities to serve others. That's the mindset that they have. They're always trying to find ways to encourage and support somebody, even the ones that they don't like. Do you know what it does when you do good to somebody who can't stand you? The Bible describes it this way. The Bible says that when you do good to those who hate you, it's like heaping hot coals on their head. Can you, can you imagine that? Burning hot coals on top of your head. It's a painful thought, isn't it? See, that's how you love your enemies. You do good to them. In spite of how they treat you, in spite of what they do to you, you do good to them. Now, that's not a natural feeling there, is it? There's, there's nothing in you that naturally wants to do that, is it? That's because it's kingdom. It's not of this world. It's from another world. It's not the same way that we are naturally taught to live. It's different. Zig Ziglar once made this statement. He said, you can have everything in life you want if you would just help enough other people get what they want. So you can have everything in life you want if you would just help enough other people get what they want. Do you remember uh, a couple of weeks ago I, I shared with you all that it was my original plan when I got in college that I wanted to become a computer engineer. And I, 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 always, I was all the way into the beginning of my junior year in college. So I was almost out the door. I mean, I, I was pretty much there. I had taken the math courses, I had taken the, the computer science courses, I, I, I had taken all the programming courses, I, I had done all of that stuff I needed to do. I was just about out of the door. And then God began to change my heart. When I was taking a class called Exploring Success, the class was led by a kingdom-minded professor. Now, he didn't come to class quoting scripture all the time, because this was a secular college. But he followed the principles of the kingdom and what he did. And in this class, he was always giving us these nuggets of wisdom. And one day, he shared this quote with us from Zig Ziglar. And when I saw this quote, this was my first step in changing my mind about how I wanted to live my life. Because even though I had the ability to become a computer engineer, and I had the desire to become a computer engineer, and I had the faith that God was going to help me be successful at being a computer engineer. It was all about me. You know why I wanted to be a computer engineer? For the money. I knew that computer engineers made a lot of money. 
And so the only reason I wanted to do it and the only reason I was committing myself so much to it was because I just wanted to make the money. But then God began to change my heart. And I began to have this deep, deep desire to serve others and not just serve myself. My junior year, I changed my major. It set me back a whole entire year in college. It took me a whole extra year to graduate because I had to go back and take some course I didn't take before. But by the time I got through doing what God wanted me to do, and by the time I got through getting all of my education together, I was perfectly aligned with where God wanted me to live my life. There's nothing worse in life than getting to the top of the ladder and then realize that it's leaning up against the wrong wall. That means that you've lived your life living according to what you thought was right instead of asking God what you should have done in the beginning. Then verse 9 said this. It said, Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him. So now he's exploring your relationship with God because we talk about getting from relationships. What about in our relationship with God and how do we receive from God? We pray for things, we fast over things, but how do we receive from God? And, and here's the thing, your ability to receive in the kingdom is in direct proportion to your relationship with the king. Here's, here's the thing, if you are not a kingdom citizen, God is not obligated to provide anything for you because you're not a citizen of his kingdom. But the, the thing is, that's not how God works. Because just like he tells you to love those that hate you, God does the same thing. The Bible says that God reigns on the just as well as the unjust. So that means that he blesses you and he blesses the person that doesn't even love him. That's how God does. The difference is that you have access to God. You have access to the kingdom, and they don't. That's the difference. But if you don't understand that, if you don't get that, if you don't know that, if you don't believe that, then you'll never fully experience all that God has for you to do in your life. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I, I've never been what I would call myself to be a rich man. I, I don't consider myself a rich man because of the definition of what it means to be rich. But I, I can tell you this. I've been in times in my life where I've had a little, and I've had times in my life where I have had a lot. I'm going to tell you something. In every single time and in every single season, God has always provided. There's never been a day where my children didn't have food to eat. There's never been a day where my family didn't have clothes to put on. There's never been a day where my family didn't have anything to live or anywhere to live. There's never been any time when we had a need and God did not provide it. Every season I've ever been in in my life, God has always provided. I've never seen God not provide for me. And let me tell you something. It's, it's not a bragging point on me. It's a bragging point on him. That means that he is faithful because I've shared with you, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. A lot of mistakes I've made I'm not even proud of. But that shows that God is faithful even when I am not faithful because I am his child and he is my father and he simply provides for me. Amen? Amen. So your ability to receive in the kingdom of God is in direct proportion to your relationship with him. This is why Jesus made this, this statement in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everybody say Righteousness. And all these things, everybody say things, things, will be added to you. He said, seek first the kingdom. Don't seek first the things. Seek the kingdom first. He said, seek the kingdom first. Now, we know the definition for a kingdom is a king impacting a territory with his will, his intentions, and his purpose through the influence of his citizens. So we know the kingdom is all about the king and his righteousness. The word righteousness, even though we throw it around like it's a religious term, it's not. The word righteous is actually a legal term. It's a legal term. It means to be in proper standing with a governing authority. So it is a legal term. In fact, it is a, it is a kingdom term. Democracies borrow the term righteous from kingdom terminology. 
It means to be in a right standing with governing authority, to have a proper relationship with governing authority. So Jesus is saying, if you get your relationship right with the king and you're putting him first in every single thing that you do, then all the things that you want or need will be provided to you. He said they will be added to you. You don't ever work for things. Hear me. Don't work for money. It's boring. Do not work for money. When you make decisions about your careers, when you make decisions about your life, do not make those decisions based on how much money you're going to make. Make the decision based on what God has said for you to do. See, people get in this mindset where when they pray, they're always praying for things. Stop praying for things. Stop praying for things. Start praying for the will of God. Say, say to God, God, what is your will? What do you desire? What are you doing in my life? What is on your heart? What is on your mind? And the, and the Bible says that nobody knows the mind of a man except the spirit of a man. And then it goes on to say that you have the spirit of Christ. So if you have the spirit of God in you and the spirit of God knows the mind of God, then you can understand what's on God's mind. But you have been trained and positioned to only focus on things. Everything we do, we're trying to focus on things. We're trying to get things. We say, oh, I want to grow up in my life. I want to become a lawyer. Why? Because a lawyer make a lot of money. I can buy a nice car. I can buy a nice... Those are things. Don't work for the thing. It said, seek first the kingdom of God, and the things will come. Some of you are way too young to be worried about relationships, to be honest with you. You're trying to get a relationship before you get the kingdom. I promise you that relationship is going to hinder your life because you got it backwards. It's not going to work. You're getting your relationship before you get the kingdom. Get the kingdom first, and then God will show you how to properly set up the relationship. Some of you are trying to make decisions about college. Get the kingdom first, and then God will show you where to go to college. Get the kingdom first, and it will save you a lot of time in your life. Let me, let me mess with, with, with my staff for a minute. My, my, the, the teachers are adults in this room. Let, let me ask you something, and, and if you will, if you'll just be honest. H have you ever made the statement in your life that if I knew then what I know now, I would have done things differently? Any of y'all ever made that statement before? Just about all of us, right? If, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done things differently. And I'm telling you that for my life too. If I knew back then what I know now, I would have done things much differently. So here's my goal now. I want you to be better than me. I want you to serve more people than me. I want you to be better educated than me. I want you to even make more money than me. I want you to have a better family than me. I want you to have a better relationship with God than me. So here's what you do. Learn from all these mistakes I've made. Learn from all this time I've wasted. Learn from all this stuff I wish somebody would have taught me when I was your age. Nobody prepared me for this. And I grew up in the church. I grew up in the church. They taught me how to do church. They taught me how to do that. I knew when I was supposed to clap my hands. I knew when I was supposed to stomp my feet. I knew when I was supposed to hush. I knew when I was supposed to shout. I knew all of that, but nobody taught me how to put the kingdom of God first. Nobody taught me that before I do something, I should be seeking God's will. I should be seeking his mind. I should be pursuing him with every single thing I have. No, here's what we would do. All week long, radio station was on R&B music, and all we heard was, was, was booty popping and all kind of other little managed stuff all week long. Sunday morning, we turn on the gospel music. Soon the church was over, we go back to the R&B stuff. Man, that's a messed up life. You're trying to live in two worlds and it don't work that way. Because on one hand, you're putting a message in your head that contradicts what God says is, is real in his kingdom. And you're listening to it more than you're listening to him. You're getting the wrong message programmed in your mind. And this is why you're struggling to have proper sexual relationships. Because you've been programmed to be promiscuous. 
You've been programmed to have sex outside of marriage because the stuff you're putting in your head tells you it's all right. And you listen to it all the time and then come to church and pray to a holy God. Man, y'all better hear me. But if I wash my mind of that stuff because God is faithful and just to forgive and he knows when we don't know better, God is faithful and just to forgive. If I wash my mind of this stuff, clear my conscience, completely turn my heart to God, he'll lead me to where I need to be. He'll teach me how to have a pure heart. He'll teach me how to have a pure mind. He'll teach me how to do things appropriately. And instead of you wasting your young years, you'll be living for God even at your young age. You know, Paul told a man that named Timothy. He said, Timothy, don't let your age be an excuse. And I'm going to tell you the same thing. Don't let your age be an excuse for anything you want to do in life. Don't let your age be an excuse for anything. What do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish? What does God put in your heart? How big is it? Your parents can't afford it? Forget it. You have a holy father who will provide every single thing that you need. What, what do you want to accomplish? What, what is that thing, that dream in the back of your mind that, that just won't go away, that you know that God has put there? What is it? Is it too big for your parents' pocketbook? Maybe, but it's not too big for he is. Is it too big of a dream for your friends to comprehend so that every time you talk about that dream, they start putting you down and saying, man, you can't accomplish that. Who do you think you are? Is, is, it, is it too big for your friends? Get some new friends. You better hear me. Choose your friends carefully because your friends are who you will become. If your friends don't care about doing homework, you need some more. You need to get rid of them jokers and make some new friends. Your friends that are being silly in class, instead of learning like they're supposed to learn, you need some new friends. Because I'm going to tell you, whether you're rich or you're poor, you're not going to get very far in life without knowledge. You're not going to get very far in life without wisdom and understanding. And, 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 and while this little man may be a jokester now in class, he's going to be flipping burgers at the age of 35 because he never got his education. <laughs> That's real life, man. That's real life. It's, it's funny now. It's funny now. But I, I can't tell you how many grown folks I know that sit across from me and say, I just lost my job. I just lost my job. And I never, went, I never finished school. I never got my education. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't, I don't have any skill because this job was all I had. They never picked up anything else. And I'm going to tell you, countless times I sat across from people who can't do nothing with their life because when they were supposed to be sowing into their lives, they were neglecting who God was calling them to be. I'm almost done. Verse 14 says this, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we asked of him. Now, again, this is assuming you have a right relationship with God. This is why you need to protect your relationship with him. See, you, you go to some churches and they water down the gospel. They make it so easy that, that it's, 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 it looks just like the, the path to destruction. Everything is so easy. They, 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 they make you feel like you can, you can say that you believe this and then live any kind of way and everything's still going to work out. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. I need to protect my relationship because righteousness is your access to the Father. Righteousness is your access to the Father. So he says, whatever you ask, whatever you ask, we know that we have the request that we ask. If not, the key thing is, it says, ask according to his what? Will. We're going to read it again. It said, ask according to his what? Will. This is why I tell you, stop praying for things and start praying for the will of God. Because this is a lot of times why you pray and you never get an answer. Because you're praying for what you want. You're not praying according to his will. And the reason why we do that as human is because we don't believe that God wants the same thing that we want. That's not true. Wait till you get old and you have children and your children come and ask you for something. 
you're going to want to give it to your child. Elisha can come to me right now and say, and say, Daddy, I want a Porsche. I can want to give my child a Porsche, but the problem is that this child can't drive. <laughs> so why am I going to give her the Porsche and she can't drive? She doesn't have the knowledge. She doesn't have the wisdom. She doesn't have the skill to drive it. So when I give her that Porsche, what is she going to do? She's going to tear it up. It makes no sense. So you're praying for God to give you something, but you're not praying according to his will. So when Elisha comes to ask me, she should say, Daddy, what should I drive? I'm like, I'm glad you asked. Here's a bike. <laughs> you get this, this bike, and you ride this bike. Then when you learn how to drive, your, your, your first car ain't no Porsche. Nope, we're going over here to Joe's car shack, and we're going to find the most raggedy thing that we can find. You pull up at the school, that, that car is going to pop. It's going gonna, it's gonna to sputter. The hug cap's going to fall off, but you ride on like you own it. That's how you do it, because you're probably going to crash the first car after she learned how to drive anyway. So you might as well give us something raggedy. See, God, God blesses you according to your capacity to receive. He blesses you according to your capacity to receive. But you need to learn how to pray according to God's will. So Lashley like can want those things, but it's better if she asks me for my wisdom and what she needs first. I am out of time, and I still didn't finish this lesson. But I think you got my point. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these young people. Thank you for their hearts. Thank you for their minds. Thank you for their willingness to sit here and learn of you, to know you, and to come after your wisdom. Father, I can tell in this room right now that there are young men and women in this place who are going to do great things for your kingdom. I can tell in this room that there are some young men and women that have a capacity and a desire to know you and to serve you. And Father, I pray that for every seed that is planted in their hearts and their mind, for every seed they garnish from seeking after you, that you return unto them a thousandfold. We look towards you in this evening. We give you praise and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all have a good day.